grew up in church. I was there every Sunday, and I've been a Christian since I was a kid. Going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays was just something we did. It was something that you did to check off a list of what a good person does. Looking back on it, it was all really a blur, to be honest. Um, all those events I did, it was just a blur. Oh, my. 20-something years of going to church, I never remember hearing the word grace. I grew up in church and I got pieces of the gospel over 50 years. I always thought the gospel was about uh, becoming a Christian, but not actually about being a Christian. I viewed God as somebody that I needed to make happy. He wasn't so concerned with with me as a person as much as he was concerned with if I was being a good person or a bad person. I never really saw God's love as a um, unconditional, everlasting love. I always believed in God, but, you know, I didn't think he believed in me. You know, I wasn't good enough. Only saw one side of him, and that was just a judge who held a lot of accounts against me. I found my identity in being a Christian not um, in Christ. Bibles, go ahead and grab them for me. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 1. I uh, want to welcome you here if you're watching at home on the simulcast. Uh, glad that you're uh, with us. I, I want to, uh, I want to, I, I know we're all over the board tonight. So I know there are some of you in here who are believers in Jesus Christ. You love the gospel. You walk in a, uh, in, in what I believe the Bible would e explain as an ever increasing amount of joy. Uh, I'll, I'll help us work through the difference between joy and happiness uh, a little bit later on in Colossians. But uh, I, I know that some of you are here tonight very much in love with Jesus, very much understand the gospel and uh, have been growing in the Lord uh, uh, since the day he opened up your heart and mind. And then uh, I know there are some of you either watching or in this room that, uh, man, if we had to be honest, you're, you're, you're working really hard to be good under the banner of Jesus, uh, but ultimately don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, haven't been transformed by Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you probably have grown up in church, so you're trying to do what you understand church has asked you to do, but really the transforming work of the Holy Spirit, the act of regeneration has not occurred in your heart. And then I have to believe that some of you are actually just invited in by friends. And, and maybe they were shady, man. Maybe they just invited you to dinner, you know, come out and hang out with me. And they got you in and handed you a sandwich, all right, man? So we're all over the map. So I, I wanted to, if that's you and maybe you're not a believer, maybe you're religious lost, I just want to, I want to get my cards on the table before I read any sacred literature, before I call anyone a sinner that's coming. But I wanted to uh, get it out on the table just very, very early. That, that I think something of great significance is, is going on in, in this gathering, in this simulcast. And, and I believe that, not just because I read it in the scriptures, but I believe that because I got caught up in it myself. And, and what I mean by that is I did not go looking for Jesus. I didn't do it. I didn't go, you know what will make my life make sense? Some sort of deity. I know, a Galilean. <laughs> right? I mean, that's... That's not how this worked. God um, relentlessly, ruthlessly, and at times violently hunted me down and opened up my heart and eyes to behold him, to love him, and to follow him. And, and so here, here's why I think all of this is, is pretty significant. Um, because you being here tonight... And, and you listening in at home, if you're huddled with friends around a computer or um, you know how tech works and you've got to actually put it on your television, uh, uh, ultimately what, what's happened here is that you've got this external objective evidence that the God of the universe is interested in communicating certain things about himself to you tonight. So that's a lot bigger than the, the book I wrote, and that's a lot bigger than, than some sort of cliches. That's a lot bigger than, you know, I'm, I'm on the Twitter. I mean, I see it hanging out with my channel. All right? I see all that, all right? Way beyond any of that and way bigger than all of that is that God might just show up. And, and so here, here's what I've learned uh, pastoring in the Bible Belt for the last 10 years. That there's really not any nervousness about that anymore. So I don't know how well you know uh, Isaiah 6, woe is me. Remember that passage? You know where that happened? Church. Just went into the temple, minding his own business. Boom, God shows up. 
and all of a sudden he's not clean, smooth mouth Isaiah anymore. Who is he? Woe is me, for my eyes have seen the king. Right? And so the, if, if God shows up, man, we can get exposed. If, if God shows up, man, we might get really confronted with the fact that a lot of us are pretenders. God might show up and, and really show us that, man, we're not really what we think we are. God might show up and, and expose our sins. God might, but it doesn't appear anymore that anybody's nervous about that kind of stuff. And, and so just so you know, my card's on the table. I've been praying for months and months leading up to this that on every stop, God would ruthlessly show up and blow up false paradigms, that he would reveal hidden sin, that he would save men and women, and particularly men and women who've grown up in church and think they are. And, and so I've asked him um, to do that in our time together. So there's, there's my cards. Regardless of where you are in the spectrum, I've asked the Lord to light you up. So there, it's just so, just so you and I know, we have a relationship built on honesty, all right, I value that, and, and so that's, that's what I wanted to start. Now, about six years ago now, on, our, on a Saturday night service at the Village Church where I pastor, uh, we were doing a celebration service, which means we were just baptizing and doing communion and people sharing their testimonies, and uh, it's my, one of my favorite things that we do, and I, um, I, I sit on the front row of our church, and then I kind of walk upstairs like this to, to, to preach, and um, so uh, I, I walked off, the, uh, off of a hallway, and I was headed to my seat um, when, a, when a heavy set younger man came up and grabbed me and front hugged me. Now, I'm not a front hugger, man, all right? I'm, I'm a side hugger, but he rolled on me. And, and so I side hug, he rolled. I got my arm in there. All right. And so kind of hugged like this a bit. And then very quickly, he jerked me back and he looked at me right in my face and, and talked really, really fast. And security was nervous. And I was just like, everybody relax. I think this is going to be okay. And um, I used to be homeless and Jesus has really done a work in my life. And God's just done such great things. And I, and I know you don't have time to hear this. I know service is about to start. But before, um, I just want you to know that I brought a witch with me tonight and I didn't tell her I was bringing it to her church and she is pissed. And then he followed that up with this, and I just thought you should know in case something happens. And then he left. <laughs> then he went and found a seat. And so then, man, I, I sit down on the front row, and I, I, I have strong emotional intelligence. And here's what I mean by that. I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm not good at. Um, I have done a ton of reading and study on philosophy, world religion, and theology. Uh, I believe that I could sit with the most adamant atheist and over a period of time have a conversation that exposes him to be the arrogant one, not me. Just lovingly over a period of time, just be able to kind of look at philosophy, look at history, look at the Bible and go, so I'm the arrogant one for putting myself in glad submission to a historical divine truth that's been practiced for thousands of years, but you're not arrogant for being your own God and having no authority but yourself? You don't say it exactly like that, all right? But that, <laughs> right, right? I mean, that's, that, I feel very confident in that venue, studied apologetics, not afraid to have conversation. I don't believe my faith is a blind faith. I'm not crossing my fingers and hoping this works out in the end. All right, that's not what I believe. Right? And, and so I know that in that environment, I, I know what to do, I know what to play, I know what the arguments are. If someone pulls out a wand, <laughs> I don't know. You pray, you, you know, I mean, you, so I'm sitting on the front row, I'm just praying, I'm asking God to be mighty, to do a work, to not let this whole beautiful celebration of God's grace and mercy be ruined by a spell. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of, I don't know, I haven't had a lot of interactions with witches, and so I, I'm just praying that God would move mightily among us, protect us, or let security get there in a hurry. That's my state of mind on the front row. Now, um, at, at our old building, the, the baptistry was directly behind the stage, and, and it was covered by a screen. So the screen would raise up, and then there would be people in the water. And, and the way we do it um, is that uh, two testimonies are given in the water. The, the man or woman that shared the gospel gives their story, and that's very important to me because I want our people to know that very few people feel cool sharing the gospel with people who think the gospel's silly. All right, and so this kind of, you're eventually going to get to the place where that doesn't feel awkward is simply not true. 
And I want our people to hear that. I, I want, I, I want uh, our men and women to go, so I walked out, I was such an idiot, and I thought, you know, and, and show that it's the power of the gospel that saves, not the power of the presenter that saves. And I want them to see that. I want them to know it. I want them to feel it and sense it because those stories are awkward. So we were eating lunch and ham, and so I was like, you know the Jews don't eat ham. Speaking of Jews, do you know Jesus, right? I mean, and, and, then, and then this guy goes, and so I was like, they don't, and I got saved, right? I need our people to see that, and then I want the story of hearing the gospel and being drawn to it despite the fact that its presentation wasn't the best. I want all those components in our celebration services because in that, Christ is most exalted, in the cumbersome awkwardness of this, in the draw of this soul, the rebirth of this soul, despite this awkwardness, you get a confidence in who Jesus, not in the presenter, but in Jesus and his ability to save. And so I'm, I'm sitting on the front row wondering what this witch is going to do, and the screen rolls up, and the woman who had received the gospel spoke before the woman who uh, shared how she shared the gospel, and she started her testimony like this. For the last 15, 20 years, I have been actively involved in witchcraft and the occult, and this is why Jesus Christ is better, bigger, and more powerful than anything I've done there. And so I'm immediately going, I knew you had that, Lord. I, <laughs> I knew you were going to take care of that. And, and so baptized her, and then the next young man gets uh, in the water, and, and his story is, a, I mean, just a sign of our day, all right, started throwing words together that don't, that don't work, all right, he was an atheistic Buddhist who uh, struggled with alcohol, that's his testimony, all right, uh, I'm an atheistic Buddhist, um, but then uh, my friend started sharing the gospel with me, all right, uh, I didn't think God would save me because of my alcohol issues, but God began to draw me, and he shares this stuff, now here's what I'm thinking. Uh, I'm in Dallas, Texas. Christianity Today, 1998, calls it the center of the evangelical world. And here I am. We're batting a thousand. A witch and an atheistic Buddhist. All right, no seven-year-olds whose parents said, do you want to go to heaven with mom and dad or do you want to burn in hell forever? You're with us? Come on. Well, come on. Right, none of that. We didn't see any of that. It was all, I mean, witch... Is there a big witch population in Dallas? I don't believe there is. An atheistic Buddhist, and, and so, man, my, I, I'm about ready to explode on, on the front row just watching the saving power of God in the testimonies of these men and women. But the rest of the testimonies that night and, and on the weekend were all kind of a similar version of the same story, and it was this story. Grew up in church my whole life, been baptized before, Went to RA camp, GA camp, children's camp, went to Disciple Now, went to youth camp, went to, and, and then they would say, and I never heard the gospel until uh, this man right here, this woman right here shared it with me or until they brought me to this church. And, and so I, I think it was the fact that um, we were about to um, give birth to our second child, and by we, I mean my wife. Um, <laughs> that on my heart, that this kind of idea that you could grow up in church and not hit the gospel or hear the gospel kind of hit a nerve in, in my heart. And so um, I, I tried to just justify it theologically like this. Oh, they heard the gospel. They just didn't hear it. They, they heard it. They just didn't have ears to hear. And, and so I uh, thought I handled that and, and went um, home that night and, and got in bed. And um, the, the Holy Spirit was not going to let it go. I don't know how the Holy Spirit works with you, but he was just haunting me. All right, if you're not a believer in Christ, that's not paranormal activity. All right, that's not poltergeist. That's not, right, he wasn't making stuff float in the room. He was just, um, he was just applying steady pressure on my heart. He was not going to let that question be answered so easily. Um, and, and so finally I needed, I was exhausted, and so I just said, okay, if, if I can sleep, uh, I'll make calls um, tomorrow, and I'll begin to set up meetings tomorrow, and I'll get to the bottom of how you can possibly grow up in church and, and not be a believer in Jesus Christ. And so I don't, I don't know the demographics of the room or online, but if you're a parent, every parent will have a story of um, just waking up and your kid will be right in your face. And, and that's dangerous if you've got some post-traumatic stress or something. I mean, they're just right there. You just respond. You choke them or so, right? And so, um, like, I woke up the next morning, and, I mean, the spirit had not gone anywhere. So I woke up, and he's like, we're going to make those calls? So I, I set up a series of coffees and lunches and dinners with a bunch of uh, late 20s and early 30-somethings and, and sat down, and, and I was really just trying to get to the bottom of this 
So you're telling me you grew up in church, you, you grew up in church your whole life. Uh, I think you heard the gospel. Uh, I think you heard the gospel, you just didn't hear it. So, so here's my task, here's my homework. I want you to go back, I want you to open up your student Bible, I want you to find your old journals, and I want you to read through what you learned in all those camps and disciple nows, and I want you to come back and tell me whether or not you actually heard the gospel or not. Now, there were uh, several that came back and said, nope, Chandler, you're right. I absolutely heard the gospel, man. There it is, Jesus' is life, Jesus' is death, Jesus' is resurrection. I, I heard it, I just didn't hear it. But by and large, they came back with like ammunition. Boom, never heard it. Don't get drunk. Don't have sex before marriage. Don't watch rated R movies, asterisk, except Passion of the Christ. Right? Don't listen to this kind of music. Listen to this kind of music. Don't go to these kind of places. Go to these kind of places, right? And on and on and on and on it goes. What they showed me was a grid of behavior that a Christian behaves like this. So if you are a Christian, this is what you do. And if you're not a Christian, you don't do these things. And that was the grid that was drawn out. Now, embedded in that is a semblance of truth but it's a truth that has to be handled very carefully. What I, I found happened to these young men and women is the type A'ers, you know what I mean by that? Like the, the intrinsic rule followers, or I don't know if you know somebody like that. Uh, like just, they, they, they just naturally obeyed the rules from, from the time they were born, all right? Like if you said, don't touch the oven, they were like, I will never touch the oven, <laughs> all right? They, they the, the type A rule followers, all right? They excelled at this game, and they just did it, all right? They um, read my utmost for his highest. They learned to play the acoustic guitar. They watched their mouths. They, right? they, they did the whole thing, all right? Um, Lord's Gym t-shirt, bracelet, did the whole deal, all right? Sweet 16 car, ichthyus on the back within seconds. <laughs> Played the game, but they became smug and self-righteous and loathed themselves deep inside. Now, the non-type A'ers, the ones that can't follow really any rules, they don't even know why, like they just perpetually were hurt as children because parents would go, don't touch that, this, that, that kind of kid, all right? They, they would just, that, now watch me, they would just get stuck in this cycle of going to youth camp and getting convicted and coming up front and weeping and I'm never going to do it again and then three, four weeks later they'd do it again. But then, praise God, there was fall retreat, and so fall retreat would come around, and then they would come up front and cry, and they would hate that they were getting drunk, hate that they were sleeping around, hate that they would, and they would promise to never do it again, and then they'd make it three, four weeks, and then fall right back into the scene. But then, praise God, D-Now's in February, all right? And so we'd go to Disciple Now, once again, come down, we'd just cry, and we'd, we'd hear it again, I'm not going to do it anymore, all right? And, and then, uh, you know, a few months later, we'd stumble right back into that scene, but then, praise God, there was youth camp. And, and then they just got in this cycle of never really getting any victory or any intimacy with Jesus at all. It was all about behavioral modification. It was all about conforming themselves to a pattern of religion. It was joyless. It was fruitless. And, and it was exhausting. And so what happens when you leave a highly programmed youth ministry for college is those opportunities are harder to find. And then they were left like a ship without an anchor, tossed about. And so finally in despair, Christianity doesn't work. Christianity, and this is all bull, man. This is all my mom and daddy's stuff. This isn't for me. And then boom, gone into licentiousness. And so what I found is a pattern of teaching, preaching, um, engagement of men and women in the church around the person of Jesus Christ, devoid of the works of Jesus Christ that led to legalism or license. And, and so what I want to do in, in my time with you is I simply want to walk through a passage that's going to um, really work over the gospel a whole bunch. It's going to come at it in a bunch of different directions. And, and so it, we'll go through different streams. We'll settle on a real simple definition, and, and then we'll call it a night. So let's go Colossians chapter 1 starting in verse 15. Let's start in verse 13. He, that's God the Father, has delivered us. Now, if you write in your Bible, all right, underline that, circle it, highlight it. If you don't write in your Bible, don't worry about it, all right? But if you do, if you feel comfortable with that, I, I can tell you how I know what's inerrant and what's not. Where, where it's in pen, that's not inerrant, all right? That's me. 
and, and where it's in print, that that's the word of God. That's how I do it. But you, you, if you write in it, go ahead, delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. There's another word to underline, highlight, circle, the forgiveness of of sins. Now, I want to point out just several things very early on in this verse. Now, I want you to notice a bit about the character of God and what he's up to. So God the Father is, is working to deliver us, rescue us, redeem us out of a domain of darkness and usher us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, let's talk domain of darkness. Don't go movies that release at Halloween time when I talk domain of darkness. Um, domain of darkness is simply a bankrupt view of life that has you believing that what you need to be satisfied is more of what you already possess. That's domain of darkness. Domain of darkness is I don't need God, I've got me. Now, here's what's crazy about it. That can play itself out irreligiously or religiously. The I don't need God, I can handle it, can, can be, uh, I've got multiple sexual partners, uh, I've got money, I've got power, I've got pleasure, I've got, that's a way to say, I don't need you, God, I'll find my own joy, right? But some people do it with Sunday school. I don't need you, God, I'm, I'm behaving. I don't need you, God, I'm a good kid. You, you, know, who, you know who needs you? The, the, those people over there. Right, right. I don't need you. I, I have a quiet time every morning. In fact, if you'd quit bothering me when I'm reading the Bible, I could probably get more done. <laughs> and so church activity actually replaces um, a relationship with Jesus Christ that, that's filled with life and joy. So instead, we begin to have these um, really these really busy religious lives that don't produce any affection for Jesus Christ. That's domain of darkness. Just as dark as heroin and promiscuity and when all said and done, uh, a seeking of personal power that's going to fade. Now, here's why it's the domain of darkness, all right? You, you want to know why he words it that way? It's, it's brilliantly worded. Here's why it's the domain of darkness. Because nothing is easier to spot than the reality that we don't know what we're doing and that where we're trying to find fullness of life simply is not working. We consistently and constantly put our hope in a tomorrow that never comes and nobody wakes up to it. So follow me. When you were in junior high, if you could just get to high school, and then when you got to high school, if you could just drive, when you got to drive, you could just graduate and get to college. And when you got to college, if you could just get out of college, and then when you, either in college or out of college, if you could just find the one, you know what I'm talking about, that mythical man or woman, like a Oompa Loompa or a Sasquatch that's just going to fill all of that void in you, that perfect man or perfect woman that, let me be straight, doesn't exist. If you could just find that one, your heart would be satisfied. If you could just get that good job, if you could just get that house, if you could just get that. Now, look, all you're doing is paying it forward. This is what's going to satisfy me. No, this is what's going to satisfy me. No, 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 this is what's going to. And you just keep building bigger what you already have that doesn't work. Now, that's called the domain of darkness because nobody can spot it. Like, nobody realizes this is what we're doing. No, nobody goes, you know, I've been to the club before. You know, I've hooked up before. I've been high before. You know, I just woke up um, feeling groggy, filled with regret, hating myself deeply and wishing there was another way. You want to go back to the club? What time are we leaving? <laughs> Red Bull at my house first? Nice, right? That, that's what we do. And, and Christians do the same, church people do the same thing. Right? We just fill our lives with events like this. Fill our lives with a bunch of religious activity and nobody's slowing down going, wait, do I know Jesus or do I just know about Jesus? Wait, do I have a relationship with Christ? Am I really under his grace? Am I, am I really walking? Has my life been transformed really in any way by Jesus Christ or am I simply trying to be good and failing? And it's called the domain of darkness because we can't see that we're in it. Now, let, let's, I, I gotta keep all these pieces together. But God, God's activity is trying to deliver you out of the domain of darkness and get you into the kingdom of his beloved son. So for all of the talk about God being so oppressive, it appears in the scriptures 
that he's the one trying to get you out of chains, trying to get you out of darkness and into light. Now, how does he accomplish that purpose? Let me point out one more thing about 13. I want you to see that that, that's, that, that has individual implications, so if we had opportunity, and we, we don't have, we can't have open mic tonight, all right, but, but if we had that, like, like everybody would have this story about how God did this, if you're a believer in Christ, you have this story. It doesn't matter what your background is, all right? Um, if you're a church kid and, and your mom, you know, gave birth to you out onto the altar, all right, your first word was Jesus and you were baptized when you were three. Hey, and, and for the record, if, if that's you and you hate your testimony, don't, don't hate your testimony. What spectacular grace you've been given. I'm begging God that my kids would not know the day that they didn't know and love Jesus, that their whole life would be a progressive, growing love for Jesus Christ. I want them to learn what I learned. I I mean, think about it. You want your kid to have the spectacular testimony? So I was high, (laughs) the back of an El Camino. I don't know how I got there. Not a vision of Jesus, right? Like, Like that's the kind of thing that makes, you know, churches go, ah, that's a great story, no, I'd rather my, my daughter just go, I don't remember a time where my heart wasn't inclined to him. So you quit hating your story. You, you have probably a more miraculous story than you're giving yourself credit for. Than you're giving God credit for, to say it correctly. So it doesn't matter if that's your background or, man, if your mom gave birth to you on a bar floor because she had one too many Jaeger bombs that night. <laughs> right? God wooed us, God rescued us, God came and got us. You didn't go looking for him, he came and got you and he transferred you out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. And that should create some marvel in us. So so let me try to help you with that. Like we are surrounded by, wherever you are, doesn't matter where you're watching online, we are surrounded by, listen to this, Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that this reality is not even on their radar. I mean, it's not even on their, it's not showing up anywhere. They're so embedded into that domain of darkness that they don't even know they're in a domain of darkness. I mean, they're just completely trapped in a worldview and know nothing of the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. But you do. And, And if you're not a believer and don't believe, you're in here tonight. This is what God does. He draws, he woos, and he came and got you. He came and rescued you. He opened up your heart. He opened up your eyes. He allowed you to see the unseen. That should create marvel in us. That should create, like David, a why is why me in us? Now, let's look at why he has this kind of power to transfer us out of this domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. Verse 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Okay, if you wanna know about God, look at Jesus. That's as simple as I can make that text. You wanna know what God's like? Study Jesus. Don't guess what God's like. Look at Jesus. Watch Jesus interact with the woman at the well. Watch Jesus interact with the woman caught in adultery. Watch Jesus tell Zacchaeus to come down from going to your house to day to day, right? Well, watch him interact. Watch him call the Pharisees and scribes whitewashed tombs. Watch it. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Don't create something in your head. Your make-believe God will not be adequate to save you. You want to know what God's like, you look at Jesus because Paul says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Look at the next line. The firstborn of all creation. Now, this does not mean that Jesus Christ was created. This is about positional authority. God did not start creating the universe by going, you know what this place needs? Another one of me. It's not what he did. When this, when this says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, it's saying that in creation there is nothing with greater authority than Jesus Christ. And he explains why in the lines to come. For by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. Now, 
um, let, let's start to, to put some of these things together. Again, I, I need to keep them connected for you so they, so they stay in your head. You've got a God that is transferring us out of a domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. And then you've got um, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, that is accomplishing this because he has created all things. He is the author of all things. He is the perfecter of all things. All things were created by him, for him, through him, to him. All right, now, that means he's the grand architect behind all of creation. Now, let me tell you why that's good news concerning those commands of God. Um, there are commands in Scripture that I do not struggle with at all. There are times that God says, thou shalt not, and I don't have any problem with it. And there are times God says, thou shalt, and I'm like, I shalt. It's not an internal wrestle. It's not a struggle. I don't have to wonder if I want to. But that's not always true. Like there are some times where it's clearly God's design and God's will for me to go left, but everything in me wants to go right. And it wants to go right because if I go left, then I'm being taken advantage of. If, if I go left and this, if I go left, it's not gonna work out like I want it to work out. And, and basically what's happening in that moment is I, I'm declaring, I think I'm smarter than you on this one. Now, if this is Jesus and this is God's plan to transfer us out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son, then we have to learn to see the commands differently. If God's not about oppression, but about deliverance, then all the commands of God in Scripture are about leading us into life, not taking us from it. When, when Jesus says the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, he's not lying. So when Jesus says, when the Bible says, sex works like this, right? He, he's not trying to be oppressive, He's not trying to take from you joy. He's trying to lead you into it. When he says marriage looks like this, money looks like this, life works like this, husband, this is how you treat your wife, wife, this is how you respect your husband. When those things are thrown out, God is not trying to take anything from you. He's trying to lead you into a greater joy, a deeper joy than you can fathom. And this is where faith and trust has to come in. Now, I told you earlier that I would help us here on the joy happiness thing. Um, joy and happiness are not synonyms. Are you with me? It's very important you know that. Happiness is ridiculously fragile. All right? Happiness can be taken from you in a second. There isn't anyone in this room that doesn't have a story of having that day where everything was going great, windows down, music up, and it just took one little thing to take all of that from us. Some moron cut us off. Some girl say something to us. Some guy say something to us. Get a little bit behind and start running late and everybody's going the speed limit. <laughs> and then what does that create? Frustration, anger, lack of patience, all of that gets tilled up and what happened to your happiness? Gone in a second. And it's ridiculously fragile. It's almost as if you can't touch it. And the second you touch it, it breaks. Come on, can you churn up happiness in your heart? Can you just right now go, I'm going to be happy. No, you can't. All right? It's just too fragile of a thing. You have to just kind of be grateful when it's there. But joy doesn't work that way at all. Joy is deep roots and an anchor that makes the ship steady regardless of the storm. Joy is what you see in the Bible when um, Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den and goes, okay. Joy is what you see in the Bible when the apostles are beaten for the proclamation of the gospel and left rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer for the sake of the Lamb. Joy is what you see in Christian history when men and women gladly praise him regardless of their circumstance. See, happiness is dictated by circumstance. Joy weathers any storms of circumstance. That's the difference between the two. You want to chase one, happiness is a dumb thing to chase. It's like a dog chasing its tail. It's fun to watch for a while, but you eventually get sick. <laughs> you, you want to put your effort into something, you want to put your effort into joy. And so when the word of God says, this is what it looks like, then we step in that direction. And, and I, I, listen, I'm not selling something that, that's not accurate. I, I'm not always saying the journey for joy is an easy journey. 
there are some battles that will be with us till glory. Will you be able to walk in greater and greater and greater victory? I, I believe you will, but you have to be able to one day at a time, one step at a time, pursue God and trust that he is for you, not against you, and that he is leading you into a greater joy than you can fathom. And, and that's what I love about that massive picture of Jesus Christ. If God is a deliverer and Christ has come to deliver and he is the architect of all things, then when he talks about sex or money or marriage, I want to listen to him because he made it. And since he made it, who knows how it works best than him? All right, let's, let's keep going. Verse 18, and he is head of the body the church. Now, I'm just going to stop there and rant a little bit, if that's okay. I mean, you can't stop me, all right? I've got a mic on. Even if you turn off the mic, I'm loud. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that has to change, and, and I think it's everywhere, but I think predominantly in Southern culture, it's there. Um, we have got to stop going to church everywhere and not belonging to church anywhere. And because here's what, somehow, if you're 35 and under, 40 and under, for whatever reason, church, the idea of church, is, is somehow been turned to like online shopping. Right? Kind of have it your way, ecclesiological buffet. Well, I, you know, I like this guy's preaching, but I love the music over here, and the puppet ministry here is legit. And really like that. Okay, that one, that one hadn't happened for anybody. But we've got these categories, and we love these categories. And so this is what I'm looking for. I can't find them all in one place. And since I can't find them all in one place, I'm just going to go everywhere and belong nowhere. And nothing keeps a Christian soul immature, weak, and teetering on destruction. Like not belonging to a covenant community of faith. Okay, can I take some of the mystique out of it all? You are never going to find a perfect church, ever. You're not going to find it. You know why? Because if it was, you'd show up and then, all right, gone. All right, everywhere you go, the church is filled with, if it's missional, if it's sharing the gospel, if people are being saved, what have you introduced into the family? Chaos. Anybody had a baby? Anyone had children? So when you, you get married, you take trips, you do, and then boom, baby. Uh -uh. Now you're cleaning poop, you're cleaning rooms, you're cleaning, right? The whole thing's different. You, you don't get to decide when you go to bed anymore. You don't get to decide when you get up anymore. You don't get to decide where all your money goes. I mean, just all it took was a new baby. Now, think about this spiritually. If a church is growing, if they're seeing people come to know Jesus Christ, you've got a constant influx of what? Babies. So please get out of your head that what Christian community is, that place we all like each other. It will never be that clean. And, and if it's that clean, then, then I would push you hard about how you're seeing those around you. Are you your brother's keeper? Yeah, kind of you are. Well, what if I, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be straight. I know, I, I know I'm elevated up on the pulpit, but I'd rather be right there with you. Um, there are people who love Jesus very much who just get on my nerves. I just don't like them. Are you judging me? I feel judged. Are you like, that's not true about you? Just love everybody. Like, here, come get the face mic. Finish this up. My notes are right here, right? There are people who love Jesus Christ very much, and I don't, they just bother me. And sometimes I don't even know why they bother me. And, and so here's what happens in that moment. If I, if I could keep us on, here's what happens to me in that moment. I realize in that moment my deep and ever need for the grace of Jesus Christ. So I am um, loud and confident and can you imagine me unregenerate? I mean, just... Uh, aggressive and snarky and mocking everything. I mean, those poor guys that God used to lead me to the Lord, I mean, I just would work those fools and they would just keep loving on me and then kept, and then after I got saved, I mean, I didn't know everything, but I knew you are going to hell if you didn't believe in Jesus. And I was like, hey, everybody, you know, and, and there were guys that calmed me down and, and then can you imagine me when I discovered doctrine? And all of a sudden, I'm the police of doctrine. You don't believe, well, I don't think you're saved. Well, I think that's a secondhand issue. Well, I think your second hand is going to hell. And that, I mean, that was me. I was just like all amped up. 
But through all of that, there were these, I don't know where that stuff comes from. I really don't. It's probably needs some counseling. But, um, but in that, there were always these faithful men and women of God who were able to sit me down, who were able to engage me, encourage me, show me, hey, man, you're off here, bro. You're off. Hey, um, you got great doctrine, but great doctrine without great love for Jesus doesn't really matter, dude. You're, you're winning the argument with a heart that shows a lack of love, compassion, and basic understanding of the gospel. Be quiet. Now, how foolish and arrogant is it of me, now that the Lord sanctified me some, um, to look at guys like that and go, oh, man, you, you mature and wing hat, because right now you bother me. <laughs> Usually, what bothers them, what bothers me about them has more to do with me than it has to do with them. You know where that plays out? The local context, the church. That's where it plays out. And if you're not in if you're not known, if iron doesn't strike iron, then nothing takes shape. And so again, I want to keep putting, don't romanticize this process. When iron slams against iron, there's sparks, there's fire, there's, right? It's not a pleasant process, but it is a necessary one. So this God who is transferring us out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son, who lines us up with the way he created the universe to work in the person and work of Jesus Christ, has called the church in the local context to be the battle, the anvil upon which we are shaped and molded into the head, Jesus Christ. Okay, now let, let's keep going from there. And he is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was what? Pleased to dwell. So again, if you write in your Bible, if you underline, highlight, I'd recommend circling that word because there's something pretty spectacular there that I'd like to turn your attention to. Um, I I feel like if I could sit down with, with most of you and we grab just something to drink and, and I could ask you what you thought um, God's thoughts of you were. What's God's emotive response to the mention of your name? I, I just have to believe in my experience as a pastor that the bulk of us would go probably frustrated, probably feeling like he got a raw deal, probably wishing he could take that whole cross thing back. I don't know, losing patience. I don't know, I did the math 70 times 7, I'm close. <laughs> so listen, that, that posture, which by the way, I believe is what drives the decline in prayer and Bible study. That, that posture, that the cross is not adequate to make you clean before God, is what drives a lack of prayerfulness, is what drives a, a lack of genuinely getting in and digging in the Bible and learning more about the one who delights in you You've got this great little evidence here that God delighted for Jesus to be filled with the fullness of God. You've got the prophet Isaiah saying it pleased God to uh, bruise the son. You've got in Galatians 1 uh, at the conversion of Paul, Paul saying that it delighted God to reveal Jesus to him. You've got this idea, this drum in the scriptures that says God delights in you. God is for you. God, um, his emotive response to you is joy. I mean, can you fathom that? Like, listen, I know it, and sometimes I don't know it. And, and this text says, well, don't, don't you think God delights in you? I mean, he, he sure did quite a bit to get you out of that domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. So, so here's why. The, the law kind of presses on us as a diagnostic. We know we fall short. We, we know we're not perfect. We, we know we uh, stumble about. And so we're just like, oh, man, I just don't think. To you. Like, do you understand that the nature of the gospel is that you can't and God can? So um, Abraham was saved. It was accounted to him as righteousness, right? That's what the Bible teaches us. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I'm one of them. So are you. So let's just praise the Lord that, right? Father Abraham is saved, all right? We find this out in the book of Galatians. He's converted to Christ 430 years before the Ten Commandments were given, as was David, as was a slew of Old Testament saints who simply put their faith in the Messiah that was to come. So if God's saving power is so effective that it saves before there was even a law, don't you think it can save 
in your breaking of the law? If he can save a, a pagan man who, who knows nothing except God going, come this way, okay, all right? If that's all he knows and he can be saved, a man who tried to pass off his wife as his sister to another man to save his own hide can be saved by this great and glorious gospel. I, I think your junior varsity slip-ups can be covered by the blood of Jesus. I just have to wonder what it would do to your heart and mind if you actually believed that God delighted in you. That you were, as Ephraim and I said, the apple of his eye. That the thought of you created a dance in his heart. And we don't think that way, and I think we don't think that way because some people will take that over into error. But don't hear the truth of it and don't go off into error. He loves you. He is for you. He delights in you. It pleased the Father. Now, let's keep going. To dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, I need to point this out because this just got a lot bigger than individual salvation. All right, so we've been talking so far. You've got this Jesus that um, uh, by, by, by God and Christ are transferring us uh, out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. You've got this Jesus who's so big. He's the architect of all things. He's lining us up with how he created the universe to work. He's put us in a local context meant to mature us, but he just got a lot bigger than that when he says not only is God reconciling us to himself and rescuing us from the domain of darkness, but he's also reconciling everything to himself on earth and on heaven in heaven visible and invisible which means that god is up to much more than individual salvation individual salvation yes but global transformation yes now i need to be really clear on this lest um, some of you take this to a place i'm not taking it um, what we see in the natural order is the Old Testament prophets talking about what the earth will look like when all things have been made new. All right? the, the prophet Isaiah said that the deserts will bloom like roses, that the mountaintops will drip sweet wine, that the wolf will lay down with the lamb and they'll dine together. I mean, they dine together now, but it's a little bit different, right? <laughs> That the wolf and the lamb will dine together. And the very next line tells us how that works. And the lion will chew straw like the oxen. Prophet Isaiah is saying all the violence of the, national, the natural order is going to be removed. That no matter what upon natural beauties you've put your eyes, the Bible says it's broken. Augustine, the bishop of Hippo, um, said, some of you might know him as Augustine, but it's Augustine, um, uh, looked out, um, Bishop of Hippo, Northern Africa, looks out at the sun setting on the ocean and says, if these are the beauties afforded to sinful men, what does God have in store for those who love him? Always love that quote. Always love that. So if you've been on the ocean, if you've watched the sunset, if you've seen some of those kind of landscapes that just pictures don't do justice to, the scripture's going, yeah, but at some level that's broken. Like Jesus wants it to be more than that. Jesus has paid to make it more than that. There'll be a day it's much more than that. But then on top of that, what I also think you find in this text is this kind of gospel of the kingdom. And, and here's what I mean by that. that. That the gospel of the kingdom is about building certain things up and tearing certain things down. Which means that you and I, as people of the kingdom, um, carry um, the new life we've been given in the, um, the, the kingdom of his beloved son to engage upon our cities, cultures, towns, neighborhoods, world. It, it means we, we have a responsibility to the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, that we are God's people and we set out a reflection of God's glory as his chosen sons and daughters. Now, look right, it's important that you get this. We're not gonna get there. All right? Jesus clearly says, the poor you'll always have with you. I'm not talking about building a utopian state. That's not coming. Well, it is, but not by our hands. That, that happens when Jesus shows up and says, I am over, all right? And all things are made new. And, and that's what we see happening in the scriptures. And so Jesus has called you to himself, to the local church, and as a minister of reconciliation to the world around you. 
And if, if you're thinking, oh, I don't have time for all of that, I don't know how I'm going to do that, simply put, that takes place within the context of your life. It's not a ministry, it's how you live. So you've been given a specific job, put in a specific um, neighborhood, you have um, specific gifts and talents, and we just use those for the kingdom. So if you're a lawyer, you be a lawyer for the good of God's people and, and the good of a lost and dying world to point them towards Jesus. And if you're an architect, that's what you do. If you're a, what you fill in the gap. I don't, I don't know what all you do. But I think there's eight or nine domains of culture, domains of society, and we play our role in those parts for the good of um, the glory of God being made visible through our lives as we engage the world around us. Now, let's, let's keep reading. 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Now, nobody thinks this is them. Very few people I've ever met actually think that's them. And, and here's why they don't think it's them. Here's why when we look at this text, regardless of where you land on the strong believer in Christ, um, not a believer in Christ at all, no one thinks that they are alienated, hostile in mind towards God, doing evil deeds. And here's why we don't. We don't because we do not lay our lives up against, really, um, God's grid. We kind of create our own grid and we stack the deck in our, fail, in our favor so that what we're comparing ourselves to actually makes us look better than we are. And so we don't want to judge ourselves by God's standards. We want to create new standards upon which to judge ourselves because we know that the standards we set up will always have us coming out ahead. So what, what we tend to do is we take a strength of ours. So whatever you're, something you're good at, some moral strength you have just naturally. And then we compare that to someone else's weakness. So it's not even the same thing usually. All right, it's like I'm, I'm a good studier and they've got a problem with alcohol. <laughs> well, it's like not even in the same family. But we're so wicked that we can use that to make me feel, I'm not hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Bill is. I study, he drinks a lot, <laughs> right? And this is, this is what we do. We kind of create a kind of false standard to judge ourselves by. And, and I, I just want to be straight, and God's not playing that game. He's just not having it. God comes to Moses, Mount Sinai, and he just drops the Ten Commandments on him. And, and, and so here's what is true about the Ten Commandments. It's not complex ethics, you know what I mean by that? So I had a complex ethics course in, in college, and you know, it was like, is murder ever okay? No. Well, what if you murdered this guy and these 5,000 people got to live, but if you didn't murder these guys, these 5,000 people would have to die? Hmm. <laughs> I just killed that dude. <laughs> right? That, that's complex ethics. That's, what do you do here in this scenario? What would be the ethical thing to do? Right? The Ten Commandments isn't complex ethics. Uh, I went to kindergarten in the San Francisco area, Alameda. Um, San Francisco is not known as a bastion of Christian faith and thought. <laughs> um, people hear San Francisco, they don't think, oh, church on every corner. Right? That, that, that's, not, that's not the context in which uh, I grew up. But as a kindergarten in Mrs. Hancock's class, on the wall was the Ten Commandments. Now, if you're under the age of 35 and you grew up in the United States, that's true about you regardless of where you grew up in the United States. Now, that means even people who didn't believe in Jesus Christ thought that a five-year-old could comprehend those Ten Commandments and that it was a good idea for culture to be built around those Ten Commandments. I'm not getting into the political, should you be able to, should you, I'm not even playing that game. I'm just saying that that's your background if you're over the age of 35. If you're under 35, it's crapshoot. All right, now... I think where people like to go now is they like to go, oh, but man, the Ten Commandments, why, I mean, why would God be so violent against the Ten Commandments? That's not hostility. That's not evil deeds. Like, if I don't covet, you're saying it's an evil deed for me to covet, for me to want something that someone else has? Yes, it makes you a deplorable, completely depraved, wicked human being. How so? Well, well let's look at your heart. So when someone else gets something that you think you deserve, what's your posture before God? You are accusing God in that moment of not loving you, of not caring for you, of not giving to you what you deserve, failing to acknowledge his sovereign grace over your life. Do you realize that some of the things that you prayed for, if you got them, would destroy you? 
If you got that promotion, if you got that raise, if you had more money, if you got this thing back, and goodness sakes, Garth Brooks knew this. I, I missed on so many of you on that when he had a song, Unanswered Prayer. So ultimately, when you have a heart that says, I should have got that, they shouldn't have got that, I deserve that, they don't deserve that, that belongs to me. You're literally making an accusation against God that what he has given you is unloving, ungracious, and unmerciful. And, and we could do this with any of the Ten Commandments. You would reveal in coveting a lack of gratitude for all that God has done in you, all that God has provided for you, all the ways God has taken care of you. And you could do this with all ten they reveal a stance of heart that is hostile towards a God who is loving, giving, and gracious. You are, outside of Jesus Christ, alienated, hostile in mind, and that's leading you towards evil deeds. And if you're in the domain of darkness, I don't, I don't know that you can see it at all, but I, again, I've tried to say this in the whole tour no one has lied to you, deceived you, betrayed you, and caused you more pain than you have. No one. I know some of you are like, well, you don't know my old man. Your old man might have been a scoundrel. Right? Your old man maybe should have been burned alive when he was 16. But your response to your old man is completely on you. It is not on him. It's on you. No one has betrayed you more than you. It's this domain of darkness stuff. Again, can't even see it. You keep lying to you, and yet you keep running back to the one that keeps lying to you. You keep betraying you, yet you keep putting your trust in what's betraying you. And on and on we could go, we are hostile in mind. We are alienated. We have done evil deeds. Now, look at this. Look at God's response to this. He has now reconciled. So, so this is the idea of harmony. Harmony. All right, he has stepped into where there was no harmony. There was alienation. There was hostility. There were evil deeds. There was aggressive acts. And he came in and he brought peace. He brought harmony. He brought a restoration of what was broken. So what's God's response? Again, for all the PR God gets about being oppressive and cruel and absent, it seems like he just perpetually tries to invade you being God of you and rescue you from the tyrant that is you. He brings reconciliation. He has now reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Now, um, that, that should really lead us into an unreal amount of worship. So if I could just take this, and remember I said I was going to narrow it way down. You know, we were going to start big and then kind of narrow it down in our definition of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that you cannot. You simply can't. You are broken beyond repair. And where you could not fix you, Christ came and he lived a perfect life. He is what Romans 8 calls the righteous requirement of the law where you have failed, like if we did a test on the Ten Commandments, you score zero, right? You don't even score a 10. You got to get rid of that, um, uh, thou shalt not murder one because Jesus is going to change that in the Beatitudes to if you got anger in your heart, right? So zero, back to zero you are, all right? Jesus, 110, and there's not that many points on the board, all right? He fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. He is perfect and spotless. Now, here's what Luther calls the great exchange. On the cross, Jesus absorbs all of God's wrath for your sins, all of it, past, present, and future, gone. And the great exchange occurs. He imputes to those who would put their faith in him his righteousness and take from them the wrath, do their alienation, hostility, and evil deeds onto himself on the cross so that we're viewed as holy, spotless, perfect, above reproach before him. How insane is that? That God would look at me and not only consider me holy, but follow me, above reproach? Here's what I'd bet. I bet I could spend 12 minutes with you and find reproach. Give me 12. I, man, I've just been up here talking. You could find probably 16, 17 reproaches. 
But, but God's going, no, 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 no. I, I see Jesus. I see his perfection. I see his obedience. This is why in Romans 8, Paul says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's God's who justifies. There isn't anything that could ever be brought before God in regards to your guilt that Jesus wouldn't go, no, 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 I paid for that. That's why Paul says, um, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. What does that mean? That means Matt Chandler, as far as God goes, is dead. All my sins in the past, my struggles in the present, my screw-ups that are coming three, four, five, six, seven years from now, covered, holy, spotless, blameless. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's spectacular. Regardless of your background, this is true of you. Because I know some people, man, you, you just think you're the sinner that's got more power than the cross. No one in this room would be considered a varsity sinner in the scriptures. The men of God in the Bible would make you guys look like the Cosbys. <laughs> so, you know, let, let's, let's take some. Um, let's take adultery. King David. Some of you might be all, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I've had adultery. Okay, then did you have the woman's husband murdered? Because that was David, man, after God's own heart, put his faith in Jesus Christ, was redeemed fully. God had a ton of delight in David. Gave him that nickname, man after God's own heart. That's a pretty legit nickname to get from God. <laughs> it's a dude that loves me. This is a dude that's after me. Well, didn't he commit adultery and murder a man? Yeah, but he, he loves me. He's after me. I'm going to cover that with Jesus Christ, propitiation of sins in the past, Romans 5, right? This is what happens. So you don't measure up, all right? Paul would giggle at your porn addiction. All right, you, you ever imprisoned and murdered maybe women and children who believed in Jesus. You haven't done that? <laughs> Go on, kid. Uh, come back when you got some junk, all right? Uh, I mean, you're not going to be a bigger sinner than men or women that God's already saved. Listen, look, I love you. Get over you. You got to get over you, man. You really believe that you're the one guy that God can't save when all we've got in history is the power of God to save regardless? The offer's on the table for you, man. Offer's on the table. Now, let's look at a little scary verse, but I don't think it's scary, but some people think it's scary. Look at 23. <laughs> What's the word that verse 23 starts with? If, indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all of creation. Now, some people look at that if and go, oh no, does that mean I'm not saved? Does that mean I'm only going to be saved if I do these things? R really, that if is really good news. If you remain stable and steadfast in what? In the gospel, in this gospel that you have heard. Well, what's the gospel that you've heard? The gospel that you've heard is that God can, you can't, maybe you should let him, maybe you should put your trust in him. So this means that the gospel isn't just what saves us, but it's that thing that sustains us and carries us on into maturity. You don't mature if all your focus and energy is on behavioral modification and not getting your eyes and heart up on Jesus. In fact, in just two chapters, at the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, he starts with, if you have been raised with Christ, then set your mind on things that are above. Set your eyes where Jesus Christ is seated. And it's not until chapter 5 or verse 5 of chapter 3 that he says, put to death, therefore, what is fleshly in you. So I think the reason so many of you have been robbed of real vitality and joy and energy is you're down here going, i got to quit doing this, i got to stop doing this, and not getting your eyes on Jesus, trusting in the gospel and letting your affection for Jesus trump your affection for your sin. It's when you begin to walk in victory when that's more lovely than that. When you keep trying to manage this down here and don't cultivate a love for what's up there, it's always going to come back and get you. And I'm not saying there aren't people in here with serious addiction that require community and um, filters on their community and some, uh, you know, their computer and real hard work and those kind. I'm not saying that's not a legitimate concern. There absolutely are people with addictions and difficulties that it's going to take a while and it's going to take some watch guards to get them to a place where Jesus is more lovely. But I'm telling you, if all your energy and vitality is on your sin and not on your Savior, then you're just not going to walk in victory. Like um, um, at my grandmother's church, they would sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. You remember how that went? Look full in his wonderful face. 
and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Did you hear? Set your eyes on things that are above. Put to death, therefore, what is fleshly among you. And so this is my hope for you, that you'd get this and you'd grasp this. And you'd understand God's delight in you, in Jesus. And that you'd, you'd feel the tension of knowing that you have fallen short and that you are a sinner and that you are hostile and you have done evil deeds, but the glory belongs to God and that he has reconciled and brought harmony regardless of that, i.e. God is bigger than you. He is bigger than your sins. He is more capable than you are. This is about a life in glad submission to him that says, I will trust you and cultivate a love for you all the days of my life. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for these men and women here tonight and the men and women out um, on the uh, simulcast. I pray that you would captivate our hearts with the gospel, that you would captivate our hearts with um, the truth that your affection for us, love for us, delight in us is about Jesus, and that regardless of what our background is, um, salvation is to be had, and glad submission to you. So I pray for my brothers and sisters who have grown up in church. I pray that you would rescue them from thousands of religious activities that have brought no fruit and life to their hearts. I pray that they would um, rest in your arms, rest in your acceptance, rest in the fact that Christ has paid the bill in full. I pray that you would transfer them out of the domain of religious darkness and into the kingdom of the beloved Son. I pray, Father, for the men and women who've come tonight, were invited by a friend and don't know you, maybe have never really understood what the gospel message is, maybe never had eyes to see that they're in the domain of darkness. Father, I pray that you grant them eyes to see and that tonight uh, might be a real mercy to them about your love for them, your care for them, what you've done to bring glory to your name and the rescuing of their souls through Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd create movement in our hearts and our feet, in our hands and in our head, and, and then we might truly understand what it means to be children of God. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. If you're here tonight in the room, there'll be men and women uh, up front who are willing to talk with you, explain things to you, uh, maybe um, clarify some things, pray with you, help you in any way. Uh, if you're at home, uh, just pray that you would seek out men and women and a local community that preaches the word of God, loves Jesus Christ, and rallies around the gospel. Thanks for putting up with me tonight. Mm -hmm.